Everybody in here was like, why didn't I get asked? I want to give my testimony. Because everybody in here, we got some crazy stories. This was an idea last night. And then I texted two of you, <laughs> three of you. <laughs> and you all said yes. So we can continue doing this. It might even be a valuable exercise if we can make time for it. But the last couple of years has been a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It's been work, but man, there's no, no better investment than what we've been able to see here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk. I'm going to cry if I talk about it. It's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. So, oh, you go ahead. Yeah, you guys go ahead. Yeah. Appreciate that, gentlemen. My boys over here, you go ahead and cry. We'd like to see that. Okay, okay. Okay. I'll pray for all you guys saying stuff like that. <coughs> So we, uh, Bill, Nate, and I, we've talked pretty consistently about what we want to go into here launching kind of this church calendar is weird, but a lot of times churches kind of, hey, the new calendar starts after summer, after everybody's done camping and going on vacation and kids are getting back into the swing of things, so whole families get back in the swing of things. Um, and so today, being our two-year anniversary, kind of being the launch of a new thing, um, we've decided to go into a series on our core values, on what we really believe our kingdom core values. So not even necessarily kingdom life core values, but values of the kingdom as we believe they are shown and exist in scripture. Um, There's a lot of things we could go into. I think we've got a pretty pretty large number of them. It'll probably take us into December, uh, our series. Um, But you'll hear from each one of us, myself, Bill, Nate, consistently. And today, uh, first week, I'm going to be preaching on the goodness of God, kind of like I introduced at the beginning of the sermon, uh, that we believe God is good. And we believe wholeheartedly that that should even be a cornerstone of your faith. Because I know I I can ask each one of you and you could all attest that evil is real. Tragedy is real. Hurricanes are real. We've seen damage, destruction. We've seen terrible things. But in the midst of all of that, wholeheartedly unchanging, God is good. And that's one of those tensions that you come in contact with when you start interacting with the unchurched, saying, if God is good, what was the hurricane about? You know, if good, God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does sickness inhibit people's lives? Why does cancer exist? That's a question that's worth answering and worth talking about at least, wouldn't you say? So the goodness of God is one of those things that what we want to get drilled into you guys and what I'm still learning and I think we're all desiring is that no matter your circumstances, no matter the time, all the time, God is good. God is a good father, and we are his children. In Matthew, one of the examples that I love to look at so consistently, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if your son comes to you, who are fathers or mothers, and he says, I want a fish, do you give him a snake? If he comes and asks you for bread, do you give him a rock? No, of course not. So if you who are fathers and are sinful know how to give your children good things, how much more will your perfect father in heaven give things to you when you ask? And over and over again, we can, I mean, if we're going to talk about God, one of our things that we say here pretty often is Jesus is perfect theology. Right? Jesus is perfect theology. When you want to study God, which is what theology is, the study of God, if you're looking at the study of God, Jesus is God. Hebrews 1, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. This is the important one, Hebrews 1, verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. I'll give you one more. Colossians 1. There's a section here, it's verses 15 through 20, that's talking about the preeminence of Christ. I'm just going to read a couple parts for you. Starts in verse 15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus, because he is the image of the invisible God. If you skip down to verse 19, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but we're skipping to verse 19. It says, For in him, for in Jesus, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. 
over and over again, especially in the Gospel of John, which is a great study to begin, ladies. You're going to see it over again. If you want to see Jesus existing and putting on display the character of God, the book of John might do the best job of it, especially chapters 5 to about 16. Jesus puts the character of God on display. And I think one really cool thing we could talk about here on our two-year anniversary is Jesus. Why did Jesus come to earth? There's a lot of things you could say, right? Why did Jesus come to earth? If you look at the scriptures, you can see he came to destroy the works of the devil, right? Jesus came to bring salvation. That's a big one. (laughs) God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You will be saved from your sin. He came to bring salvation. But salvation is not the primary reason he came. He came to bring the kingdom, right? When he says in Matthew 3 and 4, he starts saying that, hey, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is now at hand. He went around preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven, saying it's at hand, it's within reach. You can grab hold of it. You can now experience it. When he healed people, he's saying, yes, truly, the kingdom of heaven has come upon you when they are healed. So he came to bring the message of the kingdom. But I think the most important thing that he came to do was to reveal the Father. I think that's what he came to do most. Because you can see, people, one of the biggest struggles, one of those questions that people come in contact like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament look so different? Have you guys ever asked that? Have you guys ever struggled with that debate, with that battle? In Luke 16, verse 16, Jesus says this, The law and the prophets were until John. That's John the Baptist who comes at the beginning of the Gospels. John the Baptist, Jesus says, is the greatest man of all the Old Testament prophets. Saying that the the prophets and the law were until John. But since then, the the page has turned. Since then, now there's a new chapter being read. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. And everyone presses their way into it, or everyone is hungry for it. Everyone, uh, everyone forces his way into it. That last piece is just saying that when the, kingdom of the, or the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, people are hungry for it. And he says everyone is hungry for it. If you look at 1 Timothy 2, it says that God wills that every single person be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants for everybody. That's a little glimpse into what God's heart is. We'll see, we see here in Luke 16, verse 16, that the page has turned on the Old Testament to the New Testament. The reason Jesus had to come is because the Old Testament was insufficient to show us the full character of God. The Old Testament showed us some of God's characteristic, characteristics. God absolutely, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lion of Judah, he is the judge. We see in Genesis, he is the creator. We see a lot of the aspects of God's character, but he's saying, I did not show it to you well enough. You need more As part of my eternal plan, I will send you my son. He is the exact imprint of God. He's the glory, he's the radiance. If you want to know what God looks like, we look at Jesus. That's why we say Jesus is perfect theology. And so in this new chapter that was, hey, here we are by the law and by the prophets, where one man, the the prophet, would hear the voice of God and he would bring it before the people. Now here today, when Jesus said, it's better that I'm going away because now the Holy Spirit will come to you, it's because if a prophet brings a word, it is not just their responsibility to bring it, it is the responsibility of everyone in the room who has the Holy Spirit to judge the word. We all now have access to the God of heaven. It's not just one man or one prophet or one pastor or one preacher. Every single human here now has the opportunity to hear from the Holy Spirit, to judge the word of a prophet, to see if the scripture says what I'm saying it says. I'm going to be skipping around a little bit here. There's a lot of verses. I'm going to try to be efficient. But I've got a new Bible, so be patient with me. It's it's different. In John, Jesus says, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing, and I don't say anything I don't hear my father say. Have you guys heard that before? 
Jesus says, my mission here is to do nothing but to reveal the Father. So everything that he's doing is what I do, and everything that he's saying is what I end up saying. There's often through those chapters of John where you see Jesus say things like, no, I'm not going to the feast. You guys go on ahead without me because they're seeking to kill me. Nope. They're saying, no, come, Jesus, come. His brothers were telling him, come to the feast. He's saying, no, I'm not going to go to the feast. And then like six verses later, we see, and Jesus went up to the feast. <laughs> what the heck? You said you weren't going. But Jesus had this, what we were talking about here at the beginning after Samada's word. He had the sensitivity to the spirit that, nope, God hasn't told me to go to the feast. But once God had told him, all right, go up to the feast, he's like, oh, I guess I am going to the feast. All right, I'm going to the feast. Amen. But he has this sensitivity that, oh, nope, God hasn't told me to do that. God hasn't called me to that. But I'm humble enough to admit God has called me to do that and say, yeah, he, he changed his mind or he spoke to me later than I thought he was going to. So now, yep, we're going up to the feast. He has this sensitivity to always be listening to what the Father is saying and to always do what the Father is calling him to do. Well, i got to follow my notes. I'm going to preach on the wrong thing. I think the, the, a problem that we can consistently come into is that when we falsely, attrib we falsely attribute tragedy to God, kind of like what we were saying, tragedy happened, why did God allow this to happen? Bad things happen, we can all, like there's nobody in here that's saying no bad things don't happen, everybody can agree, terrible, tragic things happen. But like I said at the beginning, the cornerstone of our faith has to be that God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. We have to get that hammered into our mind and realize that when tragedy happens, he is not the author of that. The power of God lies within when tragedy happens. He has the ability and the desire to redeem those situations into something beautiful for the kingdom. The best and biggest example you can see of this is Jesus being put to death by his chosen people. God was put to death by the chosen people of God. In that ugliest moment in human history there where God is hanging on the cross, he still chooses to forgive them. Hey, there's another taste into the, the character of God, forgiveness as they are putting you to death. Forgiveness, forgiveness, mercy, mercy. This tragic moment when the chosen people of God put Jesus to death, God turns that tragedy into the most poetic moment in human history where all of our salvation, all of our hope now lies in his resurrection from that tragedy. Coming back to defeat the devil, coming back to defeat our sins, to defeat death, so that now we, if we put our faith in him, we can rise to new life with him. Right? He turned the most tragic thing into the most beautiful thing. How does he do this? In John 8, we see an example. Again, remember, Jesus, what he does is he puts God's character perfectly on display. The character of God was perfectly dwelling within Jesus. Jesus is now introducing to the chosen people of God, remember, he came to the Jews. Jesus came to the Jews so that in their rejection of him, the gospel or the good news of the kingdom would then be opened up to everyone. Jew, Gentile, anyone who wants it can have it, right? So Jesus came to the Jews to minister to the Jews, and he's redeeming this thing that where they think, this is what the law says, Jesus, so what do you say? In John 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They just threw this opportunity. Jesus, this is what the law and the prophets said. In Luke 16, he says, That page has been turned. Now I'm introducing you to the character of the Father, of the perfect good God. He's turning the page, saying, this is what the law and the prophets say. So, Jesus, what do you say? Just toss him a softball. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Now, Jesus, see, it's a conundrum. If you say, yes, stone her, then you're going against the loving message you've said. But if you say, don't stone her, then you're going against the law, and people aren't going to believe in you. They're trying to catch him in a trap. <clears throat> they said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. I would give everything away if I could know what he wrote on the ground. That would be awesome. 
He bent down, wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who was without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more bent to the ground and wrote. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Remember, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Not accused, not allegedly. She was caught in the act of adultery. That's awkward, that's weird. They dragged her out of the house because she was caught. I don't know, like, this could be a naked woman that she's there accusing of adultery in the middle of the desert. You know what I mean? Like, this is an awkward moment in a hundred different ways. She has no hope because she was caught in the act. They all walked up with stones. He said, hey, you who are without sin, you can cast the first stone. And they all dropped their stones one by one. They all walked away. Jesus said to the woman, he stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Amen. Doesn't, to me, that sounds like a father-daughter moment. Do you see that? That when there's hopelessness, when there's brokenness, when there's failure, Jesus is there to offer mercy forgiveness, hope. She's about to be put to death (laughs) in a really bummer of a way to be put to death. And Jesus said, hey, let me me convict all of you of your sin before you feel the right to come and judge her. You guys walk away and now it's just me and you. In this moment, I say, is no one condemning you? She says, no one. He says, "Then then I don't condemn you either. He also says, pay attention, he also says, go then and sin no more. Right? It's like those moments where you're like, your kid needs to get in trouble, but they've already been embarrassed in front of everybody, so it's like they kind of already learned their lesson. <laughs> Do we really need to keep running with this? No, I'm going to show you love and mercy and kindness, and now you can go on and do the next thing. Over and over again through the Scripture, Jesus wants to show the love and the mercy of the Father. Amen. So Jesus, the way he showed his power to people, if you look at the life of Jesus, there's this idea that he's always showing love, right? He says the most important two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's a sexy message in the church, right? It wins. It's right. There's nothing, that's absolutely right. Please, 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 please. Yes, if you hear anything ever in any message we ever give, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That would solve almost all the rest of your issues. It would allow you to love other people. It would allow you to live the life you want to live in righteousness. But you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love is a big message of Jesus. Here we see mercy is a huge message of Jesus, right? We have a nonprofit in this building. What do we call it, Nate? 70 times 7. Where does that come from? Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Peter says, Jesus, or Rabbi, how many times should I forgive my brother? As many as seven times? Jesus says, no, I tell you the truth. I tell you 70 times, seven times, forgive him. Jesus is just putting on display the heart of the Father. If your brother repents, you forgive him. If he goes and sins against you seven times in the same day, 70 times, seven in the same day, and he repents, and he repents, that's a big one, you forgive him. Absolutely, wholeheartedly, every single time, because in the Lord's Prayer we say, Father, forgive us the way we forgive other people, or show us the same mercy that we show to other people. If you're withholding forgiveness, you might be losing out and missing out on forgiveness and really a whole walk with God. That withholding forgiveness, there's parables all throughout it to say, when you withhold forgiveness, you're just throwing yourself in prison, right? You thought you were throwing the person you're not forgiving into prison, but really you're throwing yourself in. You're giving yourself over to the captors. There's a lot there. I'm not going to preach on forgiveness, but forgiveness is a very important topic as it comes into the kingdom because God showed us the ultimate forgiveness, right? While we were still enemies of his, while we were orphans, while we were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, while we were blind to our sin, he came and adopted us into his family, gave us a new identity, gave us a gift of righteousness. So it's not by what we do. We have a gift of righteousness. You are now righteous 100%. Here you go. New identity, new life. You are a son of the king. You have hope. You have grace waiting for you all the time, forgiveness all the time. So you are called to also forgive. 
So we see the love of God on display. We see Jesus over and over again harping on the idea that we need to show mercy. We need to forgive. Forgive like you have forgiven. We see Jesus say in John 13, it says, John 13, when all things were in his hands, when he knew that all, everything was in his hands, and when he knew where he had come from and where he was going back to, he fully realized, I am the Son of God with all authority in heaven and on earth. In that moment, in John 13, he takes off his cloak, bends down, and washes his disciples' feet. When he knows he has all the power, all the authority, I am the Son of God, I'm going back to heaven to sit at the right hand of God, I'm going to serve you in such a way where I will wash your dirty, musty, sandy, desert feet. And then he tells me, you know who I am, right? tells his disciples, you know who I am, right? You know where, where I'm going and where I came from. You know these things. I'm telling you, if, if I do this, you need to go and do likewise. Amen. Serve. <clears throat> Serve people so far below you, it's not even funny. <laughs> There's no gap as big as Jesus and the disciples that we can come in contact with. But he's basically saying, anyone you come in contact with, service is a primary and that's that loving others as you would have them do to you, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, there's one big, 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 big thing that we're missing in the life of Jesus where he put on display God. I think you heard it in Sean's testimony here when you said, I have seen. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen necks healed. I've heard, seen backs healed. I've seen the supernatural happen. Did Jesus do anything supernatural? Did he heal anyone? Did he cast out any demons? Did he, heal, did he feed thousands and thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish? You can go down the list. Did he come back from the dead? <laughs> did he raise Lazarus from the dead? I gotta find, I gotta find the scripture on this one. I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss this one. Amen. Hmm. Dang new Bible. I know what it says from my memory. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Jesus says, it is good that I'm going away, right? Which is never makes sense to me. Jesus, the reason we're here, our Savior, the king of our church, the head of our church, Jesus says, it's good that I'm leaving. That's never the case, right? It's never good for you to go, Jesus. Why would that be a good thing? He said, it's good that I'm leaving because I will send you another helper. I will send you another helper. And that word another doesn't mean similar to, it means the same. It doesn't mean like, hey, this stool is similar to that chair. No, it's saying like, I'm sending you another chair, the blue kind with the, with the stuff on it and the four legs. And like, that's, that's what I'm, I'm sending you another one of these. And he says, if you follow me, anything you ask in my name, I will do for you. Amen. Anything. Amen. He doesn't mince words there. He says, I tell you the truth, any, th those who come after me will do greater things than I have done. There is a power that Jesus operates within. I'm sure Jesus, the Son of God, was a really good man for those first 30 years, wasn't he? Right? He never sinned, it says. He was a woodworker. Great man. Right? Yes. Jesus, those first 30 years, never sinned, did incredible things, but his ministry began when the Holy Spirit descended upon him, right? The power of God descended upon him and sat and rested on him. It was at that point where his ministry began and the supernatural couldn't be stopped, right? Amen. That everywhere he went, he was listening to the Father and doing what the Father said. Let me tell you why this is so important to know exactly, to study Jesus. It's, please study Jesus. Please study Jesus. He says here, let me find it. Okay, so Jesus, at this point, we're in John 20. Jesus dies. He's, per, he's put to death on the cross. Now he's risen to new life. The disciples have heard about it, but they haven't seen him yet. Just Mary's seen him. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews the disciples were up in a locked room because their leader just got crucified. They're scared, right? <laughs> who's next after you get Jesus? His followers, right? <laughs> the people who are most closely with him, who've been with him the last three and a half years. His disciples were up there in fear of the Jews. The doors were locked. 
Jesus came and stood among them. Remember that power we talked about? The doors were locked. (laughs) They weren't looking for anybody to get in. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side where he had been pierced. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. You see that at that point is when they were glad? Like when the dude just shows up in the room that you have locked down, and he shows up and says, hey, peace be with you. That just went right over their heads. Because once he showed them their hands and the side, then they were like glad to see him. And Jesus had to say it again. Jesus said to them again, yes, peace be with you, because they weren't ready for it the first time. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, you see him say, right, what the Great Commission is, right? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine, all of it, heaven, earth, everything. I have all of the authority. That means the devil has no authority, and I tell you, go and make disciples, teaching them all that I have taught you, showing them everything I've shown you, loving them the way I've loved you. You have the authority that I now have. I will never leave you. I will be with you to the end of the age, to the ends of the earth. I'm with you. Go and do what I have done. The reason it's so important that we see that Jesus commissions us the same way he was commissioned from the Father is because Jesus' primary mission was to bring the character of the Father to the forefront of his message. To say, this is who God is. The Old Testament communicated a portion of it, but there is more. Let me show you. And we see scripturally that he is the perfect representation of God. And now he's saying, as I have been sent by God, I am now going and going to send you. You are now sent with the same commission, the same standard of living. Absolutely, that sexy message of love we want in there. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. First and foremost, yes. Mercy, forgiveness, absolutely, yes. Servanthood, serve, love, put people above yourselves over and over again. But if, guys, if we miss the power, if we miss the power, we lose so much of what Jesus did. We lose so much of the message of Jesus. If you take Christianity without power, you know whose approval you will receive? Man's. That's easy. Are you going to love people? Are you Are going to serve people? Are you Are going to be generous with people? Are you Are going to forgive people and show this, show this overwhelming mercy to people? That's so great. Grace, all that, that's great. Power. Authority. That new message of the kingdom is what God Jesus killed. Is where persecution came. Is where it had the Pharisees behind closed doors saying, what are we going to do? We can't oppose him to his face. Just look. Look at what he does. Do you remember in John, whatever, when the, the soldiers came to arrest him? I should know, John 17, John 18, I think. When the soldiers come to arrest him, and say, Jesus comes up to him and says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus goes, I am he. And they all fall down. They are thrown back when Jesus says, I am. That's powerful. They all are like, cool, cool, cool. They get back up, they're like, okay. So we're going to arrest you now, I guess, if that's cool with you. (laughs) Peter tries to chop the ear off. He says, no, don't. Puts the ear back on. (laughs) And he goes with them. Right? I mean, everybody along the way knew that Jesus could call the angels down at any point. The devil knew it. Hey, throw yourself off this cliff. The angels will come and say, you know, you won't even strike your toe against a rock. Right? The devil knew what he could get. He's up on the cross, and the two guys on the other side of him are like, wait, if you're the son of God, get us out of here. This is terrible. But over and over again, Jesus says, should I pass on the cup that God has given me? He begged God to take it from him. If there is another way, please take this from me. He wasn't pumped about it, but he was 100% willing to do it for us. And when we take the power out of Jesus' message, we're going to be approved by man. We will. Because it's a good message. But when we say we refuse to compromise on this thing, that Jesus healed everyone, that Jesus fed everyone that came to him, 
everyone that came to him, and everyone the Father sent him. Amen. Right? Because he did walk past people. He didn't just walk by and heal everybody he saw. He healed the people that came to him. The man at the pool says, oh, I always want to be healed, but when the pool stirs up, no one's there to help me in. This pool is a place where people get healed, so there's a lot of people that are probably not healed there. He heals this one man. The colony of Solomon in Acts 3, Peter and John heal the man who's been there for years, it says. He's been crippled for years. He's asking for gold, for silver. Peter says, I don't have gold or silver, but what I do have I give to you. Stand up and walk. He was there when Jesus walked by him too. So Jesus healed everyone who came to him. Jesus healed everyone the Father sent to him. He healed people with faith who, didn't, who weren't on his mission field. Remember the Syrophoenician woman who says, my daughter is this, she's this, I, I need you to heal my daughter. And Jesus is like, I shouldn't give the bread to the dogs, basically. The bread that's on the table is not meant for you, it's for the people of God. And she says, even the dog gets the crumbs. And Jesus is like, look at this faith. Which is amazing to me that Jesus is impressed with her. She's so hungry for the supernatural, for deliverance, that she can't be offended by what he just said. His ministry wasn't to her, but man, the faith. Your daughter's healed. Jesus did the supernatural. He went on to say that those who follow after me will do greater things than I have done. That anything you ask in my name will be done for you and given to you. Amen. Kingdom life, we believe God is good and God wants to give good gifts to his children. He's a good father. If your children come to you and ask for fish or bread, are you going to give them snakes and rocks? No. In the same way, when we come to God and ask for good things, is he going to give us snakes and rocks? Absolutely not. There needs to be a cornerstone of our theology that says God's goodness is non-compromisable. We can't compromise on the fact that God is good. He is a good father. This is who he is because when tragedy strikes, you will question it. If you refuse to, you will continue to build up trust in him. If you don't have that settled before tragedy comes, when tragedy comes, you will not go to him. You will go put your trust in someone or something else. What will comfort me if I don't believe God is good, God is the author of this tragedy, if I put blame on him, when the tragedy comes, I will turn to my vices or to my people who will always let me down. They're not built to sustain that level of love, that level of worship. Only God can handle it. Only God can truly come through for you. And we need to renew our minds to the fact that God is good all the time. One last thing. Yeah. I don't know if I have time. It's a lot. Thanks, man. All right, I'm going I'm to do this, but I stole it from someone, so I'll do it quick. <clears throat> Another preacher preached this, and I just feel like it's relevant for this point right here. That the goodness of God leads people to repentance. You guys have heard that, right, in Romans? It says it's the goodness of the loving kindness of God that leads people to repentance. So if we have the same mission, if God's mission was to show his character to the people so he sent Jesus, Jesus' mission was to reveal the Father to his people, and then he commissioned us with the same mission to say, go and do likewise, go and do what I have done. We can believe that it was Jesus' goodness in love and in mercy and in servanthood and in the power of the Holy Spirit that people came into the kingdom, right? Right? And so then he sends us the same way, and we see throughout the Acts of the Apostles that people are healed, people are saved, that thousands come to know the Lord. Right? And a lot of times it's not because of the message. It's because somebody's healed or somebody's this or somebody's that. Even when people did get healed, the Acts 3 reference, when Peter heals that man who's lame, he preaches a message where he's basically saying, you idiots killed Jesus. And they couldn't be offended because by what they just saw what they saw. And it says thousands came to the faith after that message. It's God's loving kindness that brings people to repentance. Okay, let me try this. On one occasion while the crowd, this is Luke 5, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God and he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets Getting into one of the boat, which was Simon's, he asked him to put it out a little bit from the land. Water works as like, a tr- like it shoots the sound out a little bit louder. So he goes out from the land, shoots his voice over all this water. It travels farther. 
And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon said, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. So they fished all night, no fish. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed closed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. No fish all night, one cast down. You need two boats to get it out of the water and almost you're still sinking both boats. It's a lot of fish, right? So they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. An example. The goodness, the power of God leading to repentance. The generosity of of God, the generosity of Jesus leading to a repentant moment. There's a lot of scriptures in the rest of this book that talks about the goodness of God leading to repentance. Yeah, we'll keep going with this. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. When they brought the boats to land, they left everything and followed him. The power of Jesus put on display that look at what I can do with nothing. You caught no fish. But at one word, I'll say put down the nets and it'll be more fish than two boats can possibly haul in. This is the power of God and the power and the goodness of God leading Peter to repentance. From that point, Jesus said, Did you see what just happened? When I told you to fish, Now, let me use an illustration. Let me compare that to something else. Now, I will make you fishers of men. How many fish did they catch? Overwhelming amount. Two boats couldn't even handle it. They were sinking. Here's the example of Jesus' power, Jesus' goodness, leading to repentance, all good things. Praise God for what he did in this moment. That's miraculous. We fished all night, caught no fish. You say one word, we put the net down, and boom. They couldn't have gone that far out from shore. Like, okay, if like, they went out to speak, maybe 20, 30 feet out, and they throw a net down, where it's not even a good fishing spot, I'm assuming. And they come back with so much fish, it's about to sink both their boats. And he says, okay, similarly, I'll make you fishers of men. Amen. What is our expectation? Are we fishing with one single line, expecting maybe a fish, maybe a salvation every month or two? Hey, it'd be awesome if we baptized 10 people next summer. Not with the power of God. If you have the power of God, what he compares it to is a catch of fish that's so full it almost sinks both the ships that were there. Everything they had available to them was at full capacity and sinking. The expectation of the church of God as fishers of men, as spirit-filled, powerful, loving, merciful, servant-hearters, Jesus followers, The expectation is an overwhelming amount of salvation, an overwhelming expectation that, man, the kingdom is coming in such a way that we will not be able to handle it without God. When we expand our vision for what we know God can do, or like my boy Nate says it, if we don't bring our experience or the theology of the Bible down to our experience, but bring our experience up to our theology, the study that's in the Bible, that people are being healed, that the supernatural is happening, people are being delivered, people are being fed, people are being demons cast out of them, people are being raised from the dead, and Jesus said that greater things will happen. Well, I've never seen that, so I'm going to bring my theology down here to say, let's just love people or be polite to people. Let's serve people. Let's show mercy to people. That's probably the hardest one. Again, it comes back to politeness more than good, loving, being in the trenches with people. But on top of that, to do any of that the way we're supposed to do it, we need the supernatural power of God with it. And he's so perfectly good. He so wants to do all the good things he can. We need to renew our mind to say, because there will be questions that come. I was talking with my buddy, my nephew Andrew, saying, why do you think people don't get healed? I prayed for this person. Why didn't they get healed? God is good. Jesus healed everyone that came to him. What is it? What is it? What is it? There's a hundred different questions in there of what God might be wanting to do. 
I know God's good, though. I know the problem isn't on his end. It's on mine. So, what did Jesus do? He only did what he saw the Father doing. He only said what he heard the Father say. So, okay, hey, let's take some time and listen. Let's take some time and study into how he did it, why he did it, what his heart was within it. There's so much more to learn, and that's why I'm saying, guys, study Jesus, study Jesus, study Jesus, because he is the Father's heart on display, and the expectation he's put on us, the mission he has now given us, is to do the same. Be ambassadors for me. Right? Take the decrees of one nation and bring it to this one. Take the kingdom of heaven and pray, God, I pray that your will would be done and your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask the questions, what's going on in heaven? You look at the scripture, man, worship is all the time happening in heaven. So, okay, we're going to continue to worship. We're going to worship a little bit too long all the time. (laughs) When we come together, we're going to worship. When we have any opportunity to, we're going to worship. Because he's worthy of it and it's literally happening 24-7 in heaven. So we look at heaven and we try to say, let's bring that here. We look at Jesus and say, how did he introduce the kingdom of people? That's the expectation that we can now have. And not be satisfied with anything less. And it's gonna, it's, that's difficult. But man, is there anything else that's worth our time? Do you want to get to heaven someday and say, oh, you, you really wanted me to try to heal people? Oh, you meant that? Oh, okay, wow, I really messed up. Or do you want to get to heaven and say, like, you said to heal people. Why didn't it work sometimes? I'm sure he'll have an answer for you. He can handle your toughest questions. He is God. He is an all-knowing, everywhere God, all-powerful God. You can come to him now with your questions, too. It's fine. He can handle it. Toughest ones. Bring it on. But we have to be okay with a certain level of mystery. We have to be okay with a certain level of mystery to say, I don't know sometimes. Scripturally, Paul references the mystery of the gospel. It's mysterious. It's hard. It's difficult. It can be a tragic experience at times. But if you can say, I will always believe God is good, you will always have a reason to worship no matter what your circumstances are. I'm going to pray for us. I got, we'll, we got, we'll come back next Sunday and talk more about some stuff, okay? And the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that.